more about the biochemistry behind the 2023 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. I was incredibly excited when I heard that Carrico and Weissman won the Nobel Prize. But I'll have to say I'm a little biased. I was especially excited for Kariko because she's just an amazing woman. I've been following her for a couple of years. She really believed in this technology when no one else did. And she even took a demotion at her job. She um, went from like tenure track to non-tenure track in order to keep working on it because she really believed in the potential of this technology. And she and Weissman were able to actually make it possible. So what is this technology? The basic idea is that if you give cells or you give organisms the instructions for making a protein, even if they didn't normal, those cells didn't normally have those instructions, well, now they could start making the protein. And with messenger RNA, you could basically give them a version, like a temporary copy of the instructions so that the cells could make things for a limited time. And you wouldn't have to worry about, say, having the instructions be permanently embedded inside of the cells. So just a little quick um, bio 101 recap. So basically, we have this molecular dogma where you, um, central dogma of molecular biology, where the instructions for making a protein are written in the form of DNA um, and the, the segment of DNA called a gene that, that has the instructions for making a protein. In a process called transcription, there is a messenger RNA copy of that DNA made or lots of copies so that you can make lots of protein. Um, and then what's going to happen is that in a process called translation, then that messenger RNA copy is used as a recipe for making the proteins. And so we call it transcription when we're going from DNA to RNA because those are really similar. They're both in the like nucleic acid language. Um, but then when we go from nucleic from that RNA to protein, we call it translation because now we're kind of switching language is into the language of proteins, um, which are written in the form of amino acids. And so we'll get back to the structure of DNA and RNA later. But they're really, really similar. They both have this kind of like generic backbone with this, this sugar phosphate backbone, but DNA has one less OH group. Um, and then they, they have these like bases. So these are like the A, T, C, G, U's that you see. And so how RNA and DNA, they both have the A, C, and G, but DNA has a T, whereas RNA has a U. And this U is going to come in to be really important because it was by finding modified, um, Carrico and Weissman found that you could use modified versions of this U in order to prevent the cells from kind of freaking out when you gave them messenger RNA. So they wanted to be able to give cells messenger RNA because you could make them do, th you could use this for a bunch of different things. The, the thing that we're most familiar with these days is going to be vaccines. So basically, if you could get cells to make a foreign protein, then it would give the body time to kind like the chance to learn how to rec learn to recognize that protein as foreign and to make antibodies against it. There were also things that you could do with like protein replacement. So if somebody has a faulty version of a gene that makes them have a faulty version of a protein, then what can happen is that um, if you were to give them the good instructions for making the protein, you could get the cells to make the, make the good protein. So there are already strategies in which you could like give people purified proteins, but this is going to be more expensive, more technically difficult to get proteins into cells. I mean, keep, um, and there are various problems, but Kariko thought if you could put messenger RNA into cells, well, now the, now the cells can make it themselves. So lots of really cool things that you could do with synthetic RNA, but in order to be able to do that, you had to be able to stick this messenger RNA into cells without actually having those cells freak out. And one of the problems that Carrico was running into early on was that, well, when you did in vitro transcription, so basically when you had these messenger RNAs, when you had RNAs made outside of cells, and then you tried to put them inside of cells, what would happen was those cells would kind of freak out. And so we'll look more at how they kind of um, detected, vised out what was actually going on. 
but it took a lot of work and a lot of time. And unfortunately, Carico was didn't was having trouble finding support. So basically, in 1995, when she was working at UPenn, she was demoted. So basically, they told her that like she could either like she had a tenure track position, and they said basically you have to change your project. Um, if you want to stay tenure track or take a demotion to non-tenure track if you want to keep working on this because she couldn't attract enough funding. She believed in this technology so much that she took the demotion and she kept working on it. And thankfully she found in the form of Wiseman a, a true believer um, and someone who would work with her and together they were able to really figure out what was going on. In 2005, she published a groundbreaking paper that we'll look at but it got little traction um, in 2013. UPenn refused to undemote her um, to tenure track, and so she left and joined BioNTech as senior VP. She was then, when I first wrote this, she had been cited like um, thousands of times, and well, I'm guessing it's even, even more now, and she has a Nobel Prize. But most importantly, her work has saved countless lives and changed the course of medical history. So let's look a little bit more about her findings. So going back real quick to the idea of in vitro transcription. So remember transcription is the process of going from DNA to RNA. And if we do this in vitro, basically we're saying that we're doing this like outside of cells, just kind of like in a test tube or in some sort of vat or something when you're doing a lot of it, I have no idea what they actually do it in. Um, but basically if you take the DNA instructions and for the making the protein that you want, or in this case, or DNA instructions for making the messenger RNA that you want, then what you can do is you can stick the sequence called a promoter in front of it. And then that promoter region is going to tell this RNA polymerase to start making an RNA copy of that DNA at that place. Then you can purify that out and stick it into cells. Unfortunately, they found that when they did this, so this is showing right here, this like in vitro transcribed RNA, they were showing that when they did this, they put these into these cells, um, this, they, for this they used this type of immune cell, and then they were measuring the kind of like generic immune response to this. And it wasn't that good like adaptive response that you'd want for like a vaccine, where basically you start making antibodies and things that recognize that specific protein as foreign. In this case, it was kind of like this generic immune response that was relying on like the innate res immune response. Um, basically, your cells have ways to detect things that aren't supposed to be there. And when they detect these things that aren't supposed to be there or things that they think aren't supposed to be there, they have ways to respond and kind of alert, um, alert the whole immune system to get into action, do inflammation and all this stuff. And basically one of the ways that they kind of like send the message to the body and to other cells is this cytokine or chemical messenger called TNF alpha. And so basically when they stuck this RNA into cells, they could then measure how much TNF alpha got released as a way to kind of like see how much alarm bell the cell, the RNA was setting off. Note that here, like basically they're showing plus and minus RNAs. So RNAs is an RNA chewer. So basically what they show is that if they put that, if they put their in vitro transcribed RNA into cells, um, then they get this response. But if they had treated the, the RNA with an RNAs that chewed up the RNA beforehand, now they didn't get this response. And so basically this is showing that the RNA itself was what was causing this immune response. Um, and so there are, uh, why might this be? They want to look into that. One of the reasons they thought was, well, like it could be some like double-stranded RNA. Um, so maybe they didn't, they hadn't purified out their RNA well enough. Um, because one of the things that sets off cells is going to be um, double-stranded RNA. So that's like why they had this like poly IC here. It's kind of like a control that double-stranded RNA will set things off. But even when they purified their RNA really well, they didn't, um, that didn't help things much. As to why the double-stranded RNA would set off a response, well, basically, you, you have to think about what your cells would need to be able to detect to find something foreign or find something that shouldn't be there. Inside of your cells, basically, that transcription process, that DNA to RNA making, that's happening inside of the central nucleus. Um, and then you have like this membrane-bound compartment called the nucleus. 
Um, and then you have a kind of like the general cellular interior called the cytoplasm. Now, in so you have DNA to RNA happening in your nucleus, and then you have RNA to protein happening in your cytoplasm. In none of those cases should you actually have like double-stranded RNA. And so if you have double-stranded RNA, this should set off an, um, an alarm. And so one because one of the ways that you could have double-stranded RNA was if a virus got in. Because like if you have a um, RNA virus and then it has to copy its genome and it's doing that in the cytoplasm, then you would get this RNA, double-stranded RNA. And so your cells have a way to detect that. Um, but they found that this wasn't really wasn't really what was the big problem. Um, and you can see that you're evoking a much bigger immune response with this in vitro transcribed RNA than you would with just sticking in some double-stranded RNA. So what was it about this RNA that was causing things? They started by kind of looking at other types of RNA and seeing what, what, what other signals, what, what they had in common or in difference with different types of natural RNA. So what they did was, one of the things that they did was they took a bacterial RNA. They took E. coli, so this type of bacteria, they took its RNA and they stuck it into cells and they saw that it got this big response. But kind of interestingly, when they took, they purified out the transfer RNA, so the tRNA, basically that transfer RNA is the type of RNA that helps connect um, the nucleic acid language to the protein language. It basically, this like blue thing here, we'll get into this, this is a ribosome. It's kind of this protein RNA complex that's going to help with the translation. And this tRNAs are kind of like the messengers, basically what they do um, is they kind of like bring the corresponding amino acid to the ribosome so that the ribosome can join it into this growing protein. Long story short, it's this type of RNA inside of the cells. And when they purified out this type of the RNA, they saw that it didn't really promote much of a, evoke much of an immune response, which was interesting. They also took mammalian RNA. And so remember, this is not in vitro transcribed. This is just like out of cells. You can imagine that if you stuck just normal RNA that normally comes out of cells into cells, then it wouldn't be that big of a deal because, well, the cells should be like, yeah, I'm used to this stuff. And so in, indeed, when they just put in like total RNA, they didn't get much of a response. But what they found was that if they actually stuck in mitochondrial RNA, they got a response. So what is mitochondria RNA? Well, what is the mitochondria? It's basically another one of those little compartments inside of your cells. It's often referred to as like the powerhouse of the cell because this is where like ATP making happens, uh, energy making. Um, and what's really cool about mitochondria too is that they actually come from kind of like cells a really, really, really long time ago, swallowing a bacteria and then kind of like adapting that bacteria to work for them as an energy, energy maker. So the mitochondria kind of got rid of a lot or most of the bacteria stuff, but they, but they kept some of it. And so the mitochondria have their own genome, their own, it's a lot smaller than the genome that's like in your nucleus, but it is this genome and it's similar to bacteria. And so when they stuck in, when they purified out that mitochondrial RNA and they stuck into cells, they found that, well, similarly to bacterial RNA, it was immunogenic. So it was setting off an alarm. And so there was something in common, it seems, between that mitochondrial RNA, that bacterial RNA, and their, um, their in vitro transcribed RNA. And so they wanted to figure out what that was. Just a little side note. So it's actually kind of cool and good um, physiology-wise that the mitochondrial RNA actually sets off a response because what can happen is that if you have damage to your mitochondria and the RNA kind of like leaks out into the cell, well, now you have a way to detect it. But that was just a side note. Now let's get back to the real story. So what do those have in common? They're highly modified. So they kind of cluster. You can kind of think of see things clustering in terms of what provoked a response, so what had a high TNF alpha and what didn't. We can see that, well, what didn't, tRNAs and mammalian total RNA, they didn't get much of a response. And also, they're, they're very modified. I want to talk more about these modifications. But you know, when the, like you're talking about, like you might've heard about like how they're like modified RNA that is put into these vaccines. Well, 
actually cells naturally make those modifications. And says, we'll see these modifications make it so that the immune system doesn't freak out. So mammalian um, total RNA, E. coli tRNA, and um, mammalian tRNA, basically these are all um, very modified and they don't provoke much of a response. So you can see that there are lots of mo modifications on these ones that aren't provoking a response. But now let's look and let's see these ones that did. So that would be this like E. coli total RNA and mitochondrial total RNA. And if we go and we look over here, well, what we can see is that prokaryote, so basically bacteria, what happens here is that their messenger RNA is like unmodified. And it's not showing here, but the um, mitochondrial RNA also has low levels of modification. So was this related though? This was kind of like a correlation, but they, could they prove causation? And so what they did was they turned back to their in vitro transcription and they put in some modified RNA letters. So they put in, um, they based on various um, previous publications and things, they had some ideas about what modifications might matter. Um, and so some of the things that they tried were basically like methylation, so addition of like a CH3 group, or in this case, um, what turned out to be the big, um, the big thing was this pseudouridine. Um, and so basically, kind of think about like kind of flipping this molecule around a little and sticking it back on. Um, basically, this is pseudouridine and this is uridine. So remember how I said that RNA had that U instead of the T? This is the U, this is the normal version of the U, and this is the pseudouridine. Um, and so basically, what they found was if they put the if they could put like increasing amounts of these of these modified versions. So they put in like mostly the normal U and then some of the pseudo U, or they put in a lot of the pseudo U and a little bit of this um, normal U into their mixture when they were doing that in vitro transcription, and then they could make these messenger RNAs that had various levels or varying levels of this, of pseudouridine or of this methylation or of this methylation. Um, so basically M6A, this is a methyl um, on it, like the A letter, and this is the methyl on the C letter, and this is gonna be our pseudouridine. Now on the, our x-axis, we're looking at inhibition of TNF alpha expression. So remember that TNF alpha, that was like our alarm bell. So the, that was that cytokine that got released if the immune system was reacting. If we're inhibiting that release, basically this is preventing that immune response. So the further we are to the right, the more the inhibition, the less immunogenic it is. The further to the left, the less inhibition of the immune response, the more immunogenic it is. Now on our y-axis, we're looking at increasing numbers of modifications. So basically this RNA was like 1,571 letters long. And then this is showing you how much of that was the, um, was the modified version. So let's look at what happened. Basically, it was if they had like 29 uh, modifications or so, they were able to get half inhibition of this. And with 193, they could almost get full inhibition. Um, and so they found that this was one of the one of the best ways by introducing this modification was one of the best ways in which they could reduce this immune response. So that was showing that it was the lack of modifications that was actually causing the immune response. But why? Basically, they showed in part that it was acting through toll-like receptors. So there are these proteins called TLRs. Um, they're kind of like watchdogs. And what they do is they bind to various pathogen-associated molecular patterns or PAMPs. So these are molecules that are normally associated with various microbes, so things like that double-stranded RNA. And so your body wants to keep an eye out for them. So what they did was they took cells that don't normally express TLRs. And what they did was then they tested if those cells would react to their, to their in vitro transcribed RNA. Um, and so they, what they were testing was basically their in vitro transcribed RNA. Um, it's like double-stranded RNA. This is their negative control. Um, they have then basically those different modified versions. And so remember that this like this symbol, this is going to be representing our pseudo U. So I've highlighted in green the one where they're testing the pseudo U. And they have two different RNAs that they're testing. Um, and so we want to track this bar. Now, what they did was in the cells, basically the ones over here, 
these are the cells that don't make the TLRs, um, any of these TLRs. So there are multiple TLRs. They're going to test like a few of them, um, three, seven, and eight. And then here, basically, this is just their this is just their control where these cells don't make the TLRs. What you can see is that in these cells that don't make the TLRs, basically, even the unmodified version. So the unmodified version is not provoking a response, and so neither are their modified versions. And so this is showing that it seems that the immune response being provoked is happening through these recognition by these toll-like receptors. But remember that there are multiple toll-like receptors, and so they wanted to see which one was going to be the most important, or ones. So what they had to do was to get these cells to make the TLRs. And so because these cells don't normally make the TLRs, they could get them to make one TLR at a time. They basically stuck in a vector, um, a plasmid. Basically, they had a backbone, of, uh, like a DNA backbone that they could stick genetic instructions for making one of the TLRs into and stick it into cell these cells that wouldn't normally make a TLR um, and get them to make a lot of that TLR. So they did this for the TLRs 3, 7, and 8. So when they tested with TLR3, basically they didn't really see much of a difference between their unmodified and their modified versions. But when they tested 7 and 8, well, here they found a big difference between their mod unmodified versions and their modified versions. So the unmodified version was provoking this big response, but in the case of this like modification, the pseudo U modification, it basically decreased this to almost nothing. And the same for TLR8 and um, TLR8. So basically this was telling them that they seems to, it seems to be acting through these TLR8s um, and TLR7s. Oh, and in this case, our x-axis is going to be IL-8. So this is, this is just another side of, another chemokine. So another one of those cellular messages. So that was great. They basically showed how they could prevent this immune response from happening. And they actually know what, what immune response actually is happening. But is it ha having any other effect, bad or good? Well, they found that there was actually a good effect. It was causing these, when they introduced those modifications, the cells were actually making more of the proteins. And so you can see here that when you have this modified, the pseudo U modified RNA, basically they're making like five times more, more protein than they would normally. But, but if they do it in cells that don't have this thing called PKR, this protein called PKR, then you don't see a difference. So what is this PKR? Basically, PKR is a kinase, so it adds a phosphate group, which is like this little bulky um, negatively charged group that gets added onto proteins by kinases, and this can affect the activity of those proteins. What happens is that if they take unmodified RNA and they, um, they have cells that express PKR, What's going to happen is that the, mod the modified RNA is actually going to um, bind to this PKR. So this kinase is serves as part like an immune sensor, and that when it binds to this unmodified RNA, it gets activated. So basically, the kinase goes from an inactive state to an active state, and it actually like auto phosphorylates. So basically, it phosphorylates itself when it's bound to the thing that it senses. Um, it gets activated, and then what it does is it not just phosphorylates itself, but it also phosphorylates another protein called EFI, EIF2-alpha. Um, and this is what we call a translation initiation factor. So remember that translation is the process of kind of um, making a protein based on the instructions from the messenger RNA. In order to get things going, um, basically what happens is you have to kind of, every, all these little pieces of the ribosome have to, and the tRNA have to all go get set up at the start site. And one of the factors that's included is going to be this like IF2. So this is showing in bacteria, but in eukaryotes, that's why we have like the EIF2, so the eukaryotic initiation factor, um, 2 alpha. Basically it's one of the proteins that helps get translation started. If this protein gets phosphorylated, um, and so it can get phosphorylated by PKR, 
If it gets phosphorylated by PKR, well, now this is actually going to inhibit translation. So if you basically, if you have unmodified RNA, it activates PKR. PKR inhibits EIFQ alpha, and this inhibits the making of protein. But they found that if they took modified RNA, well, then it wasn't actually binding to PKR. And then it was, PKR wasn't getting activated. PKR wasn't phosphorylating EIF2 alpha, and therefore translation was going to proceed normally. So this is actually showing the data that they actually found. And so basically what you have here is here they're measuring the levels of phosphorylated PKR. So remember that when PKR gets activated, it phosphorylates itself. Um, and so this can be, they can use this to kind of measure PKR activation. So this is looking at total PKR and then the phosphorylated. So this is their positive control where they have this double-stranded RNA and they see that they get this high, high activation. If they stick in their unmodified RNA, they also get a, um, an activation. Um, but if they stick in the unmodified RNA, well, now they're getting a lot less. Um, and they could also look at EIF2 alpha phosphorylation um, to look at the phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha, um, which remember then inhibits translation. What they found was basically, if they um, have the unmodified version, it is, it is causing the phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha. But if they have the modified version, you get a lot less of that, a lot less of the activation, showing yet again, uh, that's basically this RNA is provoking, um, is activating PKR, which is inhibiting EIF2 alpha. And this explains why we get this increase of translation if we have unmodified RNA, um, but that benefit goes away if the cells don't have PKR. The difference between them goes away if the cells don't have PKR um, because, well, here there's no difference. They're not activating or inactivating. So that's going to be really helpful to get cells to make a lot of things. And it's really helpful to get cells to make a lot of viral protein that the body can then recognize as foreign and can promote a, a immune response to basically one of those good immune responses. So not that generic thing that would basically just make a shut down protein production, but instead a adaptive immune response that makes us like make specific antibodies that can go after the virus, um, as well as like T cell things to go after the virus. So various things that we could do based on being able to make this messenger RNA for a short amount of time. And because we can, and remember that it's not just for vaccines, we can also use it for things like protein and replacement. So why synthetic RNA? Um, basically, well, one of the greatest things that we, one of the reasons why we were able to get vaccines for COVID so quickly was because you can kind of quote unquote easily, not as easily as it sounds, adapt the sequence to get cells to make any protein or version of a protein, as long as you know the mRNA sequence you need. Um, so there's actually a lot of optimization that goes into kind of like trying to figure out the exact perfect way to do this and the sequence and the modifications and all of these things. Um, but it, it can be done and um, relatively, relatively easy compared to some other things. Since the protein is made like, like inside the cells, like it normally would be, it gets modified and folded like it normally would, which isn't always the case if you try to express or make proteins outside of the body or outside of an organism. There's no need to purify it and potentially mess things up during the purification. It doesn't incorporate with your DNA, so there's no risk of it causing mutations to your DNA. And the effects are temporary, which can be good for some purposes, like getting it to make um, viral proteins. But there are some challenges. Um, so one is that generic immune response causing inflammation, et cetera. So I know that they improved that by incorporating modified nucleotides and things like that, um, but it can still provoke an immune response. Another thing is kind of like getting it into cells without degradation. So one of the things that helps with this is like lipid nanoparticles or L LNPs. Um, and so this is actually how like the messenger RNA vaccines are delivered is in the form of these like lipid nanoparticles. So basically they're going to have this kind of lipidy coat that's going to allow them to get inside of our cells. And they can actually make modifications to that lipidy coat in order to kind of um, rev up the immune system a little 
but not as much and not in that like generic way that's going to kind of cause problems, but more in a way just like as an adjuvant, like, okay, hey cells, this is going to be foreign, so start recognizing it. Um, you could, there's also, it's, sometimes it's like hard to get the messenger RNA into specific cell types, um, which would be mainly an issue if you're trying to do like protein replacement um, and you need to get the protein made in specific cells. Um, and, or if you're doing like, a, for like a, yeah, like a non-secreted protein. So if you're making like a protein that gets secreted, well, now it can get to where it needs to hopefully, but if you need a protein to be made in a specific cell, um, then you need a way to kind of get it into that specific cell and make it. Um, and the effects are temporary. And so that might be bad if you need to re-administer them long-term. But this can last longer, say, than if you were to just like inject a protein that then would get degraded. So lots of great stuff about synthetic RNA. We have Kariko to thank for this. She is an amazing woman. So I will post a link and I encourage you to go and read more about her. She has just this incredible story. Um, and so basically, it wasn't just that she kept working when people didn't believe in her, but she actually had to struggle and fight even before then. So basically, she was born and grew up in Hungary, but there were limited opportunities to study there. And so she moved to the U.S. To, in 1985 to work at Philadelphia's Temple University. Um, she took her husband and her daughter, who was only two at the time, and fun fact, went on to become an Olympic gold medalist in rowing. Um, and she actually took like a teddy bear stuff with the money that they got from selling their car on the black market um, because there were restrictions for Hungarians bringing things to the U.S. Um, and so then she started working at Temple. She moved to UPenn. Um, and well, there's where she had all that problem with UPenn. Um, not not believing in her. But of course, then once she actually was making stuff, then they, they were happy to take credit. So I'm a little, yeah. But anyway, I'm very, very excited that Kariko um, is finally getting the recognition that she deserves, um, a well-worn or Nobel Prize, so many lives saved and so many future lives to be saved and improved um, because of their work. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Kariko and Wiseman.